this event uh, pan out in a proper fashion. And also, uh, Mr. Alok Shalkar is a brother of uh, Professor uh, Tapun K. Shalkar from Calcutta. I welcome all the colleagues, uh, seniors, uh, students, uh, special mention to Professor Anandan, Professor Mohanan, Professor Siddiqui, Dr. Dikti, uh, Dr. Abdullah, all my friends, colleagues, uh, and others. Just a, a couple of things uh, regarding Professor Sarkar, as I mentioned, he was a true friend of uh, APS and NTTS Kerala chapter. Uh, we have several memories uh, in connection with various events. We have traveled together, attended same conferences where he, of course, was uh, at a different level than us, but we are really privileged to uh, spend a lot of time with him technically. Uh, as well as in some other ways, because as you know, as you'll be seeing, he was a you know a very diversified and multifunctional personality. So I have the privilege to spend time in Kolkata giving ANC and Indian Antenna Week, and then I've seen several version of Antenna Propagation Symposium. He visited us in 2016 in Shannon Centennial Workshop, and then I took the INE Workshop on Electromagnetics, and then he was a keynote speaker in Race 2018. And oh, another co-located conference at uh, NIT PG IMI CPW, uh, which was organized by a team of Professor Raghavan. And recently, as I was mentioning in the introduction, he uh, last visited us in 2019, Tengas, which was a Region 10 conference on UN Remote Sensing Society, whose uh, event was uh, financially and technically supported by AP Society. So with all these things, I can say he was a friend and he was a motivator, he was a guide, as a mentor, uh, and of course, a pathfinder for uh, our chapter, our society. So uh, with this, uh, you know, we'll be moving to the next part of the event. So before I uh, uh, take over on the next part, let me just share a small uh, presentation with all of you. So students, please let me know when you uh, see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, we once again uh, welcome uh, Professor Mata. Uh, thank you very much. These are some of the moments with uh, Professor Sarkar. And we are pleased to have uh, Ms. Sijata, uh, Mr. Alak Shankar, and Professor Magdina Saladar Palma with us. Uh, she has supported us through the different moments of Professor uh, Sarkar. And this initiative, L4 initiative of MCTS Kerala is a unique initiative which we started during pandemic in April last year. And under this initiative, we have uh, organized several events. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, Professor Sarkar's name was there very much in my mind to be one of the speakers. But as you all know, during that time, uh, he fell sick and uh, we are here. And we had uh, several presidents of AP and NTT Society and various other stalwarts from AP and NTT platform across the globe under this particular initiative. This is what I was mentioning, Tengras 2019 at uh, Kochi, Kerala, where after his uh, keynote speech, my friend uh, Dr. Naresh from NRC Hyderabad and myself giving a memento. And this is another unique moment for us. This was the formal inauguration of APS. Uh, uh, student branch of IIST, and this is, uh, you know, a snap of Shannon Centennial Workshop, uh, and that was uh, published in local newspaper Times of India in tribute uh, to 100th birth anniversary of uh, Professor Shannon. And, uh, you know, uh, I was privileged, but sad, very sad moment, of course, but uh, I was there in the virtual funeral session that was organized by his family and it was uh, live casted in Zoom platform by AP Society. And I would just like to uh, you know, mention that the formation of the AP chapter in Kerala and uh, you know, through certain process, uh, getting the best chapter award. Uh, I mean, I think we should dedicate this to Professor Tapan Kesarkar. Thanks to my predecessors, Professor Mohan and Professor Anandan, we got this particular award in. 2018, and I'm also happy to inform you all that in 2021, we are one of the recipients of uh, NTTS Kerala chapter. So uh, that's it from my side. Uh, I uh, invite, take this opportunity to, to invite Professor Mata here physically sometime. This is a snap of famous Komalam Beach, one of the uh, famous uh, location and one of the favorite location of Professor Sarkar. We have spent uh, several times uh, 
uh, there we think so with this uh, this part uh, is over and as i have been uh, told to convene this particular session so next uh, i would request our student volunteers to play a small video which is prepared uh, by mtts kerala aps gc button and the site committee of aps over to you sivada A tribute to Professor Tapan Kumar Sarkar. Professor Tapan Sarkar, a legend in the field of electromagnetics, was born in Kolkata on 2nd August 1942 to Dr. Sanat Kumar Sarkar and Srimati Meera Sarkar. He received his B.Tech degree from IIT Kharagpur, India, M.Sc. in Engineering degree from University of New Brunswick, Canada, and M.Sc. Ph.D. degrees from Syracuse University, USA. He was a faculty member of the Rochester Institute of Technology from 1976 to 1985 and was a research fellow with Gordon Mackey Laboratory, Harvard University, Cambridge from 1976 to 1978. He joined Syracuse University in 1985 as a professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Syracuse University and held that position till he breathed last on March 12, 2021. He has authored innumerable journal articles and books and book chapters too in the field of electromagnetics and signal processing with application to system design. He received numerous prestigious awards and accolades during his lifetime which includes Dr. Honoris Causa from University Place Pascal France in 1988, Polytechnic University of Madrid Spain in 2004 and from Aalto University Helsinki Finland in 2012 he received the medal of friend of the city of clermont ferrand france in 2000 in 2020 he became the recipient of prestigious ieee electromagnetic field award he served the editorial board of ieee journals in various capacities he was nominated as a member of antinas and propagation society administrative committee for multiple terms and was elected the president of society in 2014 He was the founder chair of IEEE APS site committee which he formed to help the marginalized society with technology. He was on board of directors of the Applied Computational Electromagnetic Society. He was member of Sigma XI and International URSI Commission. His personal attributes included a brilliant mind with a great sense of humor. He was a very loyal and generous friend. and a supportive mentor he loved pets wildlife and gardening he also was an ardent reader of history and loved different cuisines which he savored with passion when he traveled to different parts of the globe professor tamil kumar sarkar has always been a great source of support and inspiration to ieee aps kerala chapter he has visited this place on several occasions we were blessed to have him amongst us at various conferences and he was gracious enough to interact with the participants and the attendees of the event some truths in life are hard to accept and his passing away is an irreparable loss to our fraternity his memories will never be forgotten and he will always remain with us forever and ever <laughs> thank you sibada uh, uh, i thank the team behind this uh, also acknowledgement to ms srijatha professor siddiqui and many of my friends uh, dr dikki from cochin university for uh, the sources of different moments and photograph now uh, we have uh, i typically 
past R8 director uh, and a past president of Antenna Propagation Society, Professor Magdalena Salazar Palmavitas. Mm. So I would request uh, Professor uh, Magdalena Salazar Palma to have a few words on this unique occasion. Over to you, Madam. Professor Magdalena Salazar. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chimoy. Um, as I said, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. And it's an honor to speak um, about TAPAN and, and because of TAPAN. Um, I think uh, you know, most of you know me well, and you know how close I have been uh, working for um, nearly 30 years uh, with Dr. Sarkar. He was my colleague, my co-worker, my mentor, my friend, uh, probably the best friend I, I had. And, um, and he was extremely patient with me, uh, always uh, helping me um, to go a bit further, to uh, work a bit better, to produce a best, a better uh, output, and so on. And um, what did I learn from him? Is just uh, I cannot measure uh, the amount uh, I learned from him and. Uh, and what is it uh, that I inherit from him? I just um, would like that uh, everybody else would have the uh, be so lucky as to have somebody like the person I have for a mentor, for a friend, for an advisor. I will uh, also. I wrote uh, several uh, profiles and um, and several um, writing about um, about Dr. Sarkar as a tribute and also as a as a way of trying to do justice to him. I'm not going to repeat that. I think. Uh, it is available in, uh, in the memorial pages that we wrote. Uh, it's available several in several places. But I would like to mention, just mention now that uh, in the next, uh, within the next month, uh, a book is coming out uh, that is probably the last. Uh, a uh, piece of work that he was, that Dr. Sarkar was able to uh, finalize. Actually, um, in April 2020, he was still working in the correction of the proofs of uh, this book. And um, my feeling is after the number of times I was trying to communicate from Madrid with him, to see what was the status of the corrections and so on. My feeling is that he was unable to complete it, at least not up to um, the standards that he usually did. Um, in fact, he asked me to decide about the, decide myself uh, about the cover which I did with the consent of the other two co-authors, uh, Ming Da Su and Han Chen, um, a postdoc and a, a student, um, well, an assistant professor right now at Syracuse. And we decided on the, on the cover and other details. And then mm, during the past few months, I went through the final review of the proofs uh, that Tappan um, left 
incomplete, um, except for some, he completed some chapters, but not all of them. So I did it, uh, and the book is ready uh, for um, to go to print, and actually is going to come out uh, within the month or less than a month. And as usual, um, I hope that you people are aware of the books that uh, Tap and, and his co-workers uh, have been uh, uh, editing um, and uh, in, in the sense that all these books are, uh, I consider them like a gift uh, to the um, scientific community. The reason being that uh, those books are a compilation of um, several research topics. And the idea that Dr. Sarkar, that Tapan was having behind his mind was to facilitate the work to the uh, young researchers so they were not needing to go looking for um, articles and so on. So um, up to the date of the publication of the book, everything was already compiled there. So for them, it was easier. And something also that um, probably is interesting for you is that, uh, to know, I mean, uh, is that um, we were always having the same de debate. We are not going to charge any copyright for the authors because we want the book to be uh, the, the cheapest possible uh, price for the book. So uh, we are not getting any any royalties. Uh, not not copyright. That was wrong. What I said. We are not getting any royalties. Um, let's just uh, charge a small amount for the price of the book. And in also many cases, the book were um, having uh, the, the supporting software for the, uh, the procedures that uh, were presented in the book. Well, I, I, this is not, I'm sorry if it looks like that, this is not like a selling uh, presentation uh, for, the, for this book. It's just uh, uh, to mention that precisely um, during these days, um, we are still receiving um, the, the work of, of TAP and uh, it's not yet done. Uh, and in this particular case, it's coming in the format of a new book. Uh, so um, he has not finished, he's continuing, continuing his work. Uh, in particular, uh, in the form of this book, but much more important in the form of everything that he left us, the knowledge that we acquire thanks to him, the, the, uh, how he, we learn to think. Um, this is the most important thing that uh, he is, is leaving us, uh, the power of thinking, how to think, how to think, with scientific ways, uh, avoid um, doing things uh, without any rational uh, base or our thinking in scientific data and uh, always um, trying to prove the truth of our statements and so on. I could continue and continue, but I'm not supposed to do that. Um, but I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to say something, although, as you have seen, a bit disorganized because um, nothing was planned until uh, 10 minutes back or half an hour back. Nothing was planned from my side. Uh, but thank you very much, Imoy, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Magda, for giving me some minutes of your time. And um, I will take this um, opportunity to express my deep appreciation uh, for Tapan and everything he did for me. My um, condolence to everybody uh, for the loss we have suffered. And uh, I'm sure that in future we will have uh, occasions to meet uh, in face to face to, uh, to be beside him uh, in a 
better way in at home, in his place, in the country that he loved so much. He was always all for India, nothing like India for him. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam. Uh, Professor Magdalena Salazar Palma, we can well understand uh, the feeling in spite of your many other commitments, busy schedule and emotional constraint. You are there with us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, uh, I would request uh, a very brief uh, comments from Professor C.K. Anandan, former chair of Antenna Propagation Society, and a close friend of Professor Tapan Sarkar. Professor Anandan, please. Professor Anandan, are you there? Okay, uh, I think he might have some connectivity issue. Let me uh, read out a message sent by a founder chair of uh, Antenna Propagation Society of Kerala chapter. Dear all, Professor Tapan Sarkar's demise, a giant and veteran in the field of electromagnetics, particularly antennas and propagation, is a great loss to our community. My association with Professor Sarkar began in 1990 when I attended IEEE APS conference in Dallas. Since 92 has been uh, a staunch supporter of our antenna propagation symposium, APSIM. His keynote speech delivered with straight face and a deep voice is memorable. His constant encouragement, enthusiasm and pressure served as the motivation for the establishment of IEEE APS Kerala chapter. Sir, you will live on my memory forever. May his soul rest in peace. Professor P. Mohanan, founder, a chair of Antenna Propagation Society. Uh, this is his message. I read out. Thank you. So with this, we move to the um, uh, most important part of the event, which is the uh, Professor Tapun Sarkar Memorial Lecture with uh, Professor Mata as the speaker. I would request Professor Siddiqui to uh, say a few words and then introduce uh, the speaker, even though Professor Matha doesn't require an introduction, but as a formality. Over to you, Professor Siddiqui. Thank you, Chinmoy. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, it's a pleasure to attend this event. It's with a tinge of sadness and with a sense of gratitude and pride that we remember Professor Tapan Sarkar and we reflect on his achievements and the honor to honor his contributions to this field of electromagnetics and to the global electromagnetic community. And also it's a pleasure to have this talk by Professor Mata. Like uh, Professor Salazar Parma said that we can talk and we're gonna go on talking about Professor Sarkar's contribution and his immense uh, contribution in our lives. It, you know, like I always say that winters in Kolkata will never be the same again and conference will never be the same again. Regarding books, I still cherish the time that he was in Kolkata in late 2019 and his books, you know, we were sorting his books in our in my house and you were you two were attending and we were discussing, you know, like he told which, you know, like the collection of books were to be uh, to be dedicated to libraries and to institutes and we still have to sort that out. With that, uh, you know, like memories, let's go on to the talk. We won't take much time and uh, I'll introduce the speaker, Professor Martha Mogadam. As you all know, uh, doesn't need any introduction, but then formally we have to introduce the speaker. Professor Martha Mogadam is the ming Chair in Electrical and Computer Engineering, Co-Director of the Center for Sustainability Solutions and Distinguished Professor at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, California. Prior to that, she was at the University of Michigan from 2003 to 2011 at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab from 2000, 1991 to 2003. She received her BS degree in 1986 from the University of Kansas Lawrence with highest distinction and MS and PhD degrees in 1989 and 1991 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, all in electrical and computer engineering. She has introduced new approaches for quantitative inter interpretation of multi-channel reader imagery based on analytical inverse scattering techniques applied to complex and random media. She was a systems engineer for the Cassini radar and served as science chair of the JPL Techmax. 
Our most recent interest includes the development of new radar instrument and measurement techniques for subsurface and subcanopy characterization, development of forward and inverse scattering techniques for layered random media. Uh, development of forward uh, for random media, especially for root zone soil moisture and permafrost uh, applications, geophysical retrievers using signal of, of, of opportunity with spectrometry and transforming concepts of radar remote sensing to medical imaging and therapy. Uh, so Dr. Martha served on the NASA Soil uh, Moisture Active and Passive SMAP mission science team and is a member of the NASA Cyclones uh, Global Navigation Satellite System. Cygnus Science Team. She was a principal investigator of the AirMOS NASA Earth Ventures mission. She served as the editor in chief of the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Magazine from 2015 to 2019 as president of the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society in 2020. Dr. Mokaddam is a fellow of IEEE and a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. With this, uh, may I request Professor Martha to start his talk? Thank you, Professor Martha, for being for this uh, you could attend this event and then bring your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very generous and kind introduction. Um, I appreciate that. I'm just momentarily turning on my camera just to send my greetings to everybody, but I'll go off camera as just to um, preserve uh, bandwidth. I wanted to once again send my sincere um, uh, uh, respect and also condolences to my good dear and uh, dear friend and colleague, Professor Magdalena Salazar Palma, and to everybody. Uh, Professor Tapan Sarkar was was a true legend, a true friend, uh, as you all have noted. And uh, you know, I would um, I would just like to take a few minutes. I have a few charts that I would like to show you. Some of the material already was very nicely presented in the video. Uh, but then I wanted to add a little bit of my own uh, perspective to that. And then I'll spend a little time on, on the technical part of this talk again as a tribute tribute to uh, Professor Sarkar, who was an adamant supporter of being practical in whatever we do in electromagnetics in, in the in measurements and in producing products that are uh, of use to the industry and uh, to the public. So let me just turn off my video and make sure that uh, everything else comes through clearly and I will share my screen. I have two parts. Um, so the first uh, part that I will share, just a uh, tribute to Tapan and then um, I'll move on afterwards to the technical part. And unless you tell me that there's an issue with the screen, I'll assume that it looks okay. It looks okay. We can see the screen. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's truly an honor to be here and uh, have the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, about uh, our friend and colleague, Professor Taban Sarkar. Uh, importance of antenna characterization and in practical application is something that was very important to Taban. We had several discussions about it uh, uh, in conferences. Uh, over uh, over meals, just sitting around talking, and you know, he, if if you ever you know uh, talked with him, you knew that he was very um, uh, very passionate about doing things that actually made sense and were practical, and not just taking uh, things because they're in a textbook. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll talk about that a little bit in the technical part of the talk, but just to, to talk about Tappan, and I don't want to uh, spend too much time repeating what was very eloquently said, but uh, he was born in Kolkata, India. He would have celebrated his 73rd birthday just a couple of days ago uh, this month, uh, a true loss for all of us. Uh, so in terms of education, you already know he got his bachelor's degree from IIT Kharagpur and then MS and PhD degrees, uh, one MS degree in New Brunswick in Canada, and then uh, two other degrees, MS and PhD in Syracuse University. And uh, he had several positions before settling back in Syracuse as a professor of electrical and computer engineering, where he remained and he was emeritus uh, there as of 2019. He's, uh, he was given numerous honorary doctoral degrees from several universities, so he was truly recognized globally as one of the leaders uh, in the field of electromagnetics. 
slides. Okay, there we go. Uh, so Tappan was um, perhaps best known for his contributions to numerical solutions to operator equations, which often are seen in electromagnetics and in uh, signal processing. Uh, the common thread in his work was building solutions that are appropriate and scalable for adoption by industry. So being practical and being realistic and truthful to experiments was one of the most important things he, that he always emphasized. Uh, he is one of the most highly cited researchers in the field of electromagnetics. Uh, everyone can look at the Google citations um, profile. He's tr truly impressive in that regard. Uh, also very uh, impressive is that he's lead or co-author of many, many books, I think on the order of 20 if I've counted correctly. Uh, and all of this was recognized very recently by the, uh, by the IEEE Electromagnetics Award, which is the highest technical recognition by IEEE in the field of electromagnetics. It's truly uh, heartbreaking that he won't be able to receive this award in person. He was supposed to uh, receive it last year in 2020 at the, at the APS flagship conference in uh, Montreal, which, as we know, didn't happen, uh, not in person, it was virtual, and the award recipients all agreed to receive their awards the following year. And unfortunately, uh, this won't be possible for Tappan, but he, the award is his, he has received it, and um, uh, we can all um, congratulate, we, we did congratulate him, and we will congratulate him uh, continually for that award and all that he has done. Uh, for, for the technical field of electromagnetics. Now, um, of course, I can go on and on about his uh, technical uh, legacy. I've listed just a few things, uh, very you know, high level uh, words about what he has done. I won't go through this list, but again, this is just a subset of everything that he's done over his decades of contribution. Efficient methods of evaluating Sommerfeld integrals, the matrix pencil method, which is one of the main things he's really uh, known for, uh, conjugate gradient methods for efficient numerical solution of integral equations, high order basis functions, and the list goes on and on and on. Again, I, I don't want to um, uh, diminish his contribution by uh, you know talking about one or more of uh, of these topics. It's just that that there's numerous. Uh, what I really wanted to do is, um, after highlighting the, these very high level concepts that he's contributed to technically, to, uh, to also um, say how much he has served uh, the community and how much he has contributed to all of us. Again, uh, speakers before me have highlighted this uh, quite eloquently. From my perspective, both as a friend and colleague, and also as the former president of the Antennas and Propagation Society, I just see so many areas in which he was important to us and he contributed. He served our community. He's got a long history of service to the electromagnetics community, especially the Antennas and Propagation Society, as well as the microwave theory and techniques. I know this is a joint event with MTT, our sister society. And Tappan was uh, quite active in both societies and uh, contributing to both. He was an ATCOM member of the society. He was a distinguished lecturer. He was the president. He was the chair of MGA, chair of site committees. And then, you know, beyond our societies within IEEE, he also served IEEE at higher levels. He was a member of IEEE TAB, the Technical Activities Board, and many of its committees. He was the vice president for publication services and products and the chair of uh, PSPB uh, most recently. Um, and also very importantly, he had key roles in creating and advocating uh, a couple of new journals, which are co-sponsored by several societies. And JMMCT and JERM are uh, those two journals. Uh, he was highly influential in expanding the global reach of the Antennas and Propagation Society and IEEE in ge general. Uh, you well know that he was tireless in traveling to regions that are historically underrepresented in IEEE. He organized events, gave talks, held workshops, uh, especially he did that in um, regions nine and 10 of IEEE, if you're familiar with regions of IEEE, region nine is South America, region 10 is Asia Pacific, uh, which had been underrepresented, but through his efforts, we really owe a lot to him because right now the AP Society 
has about a third of its membership coming from Region 10, and he was a, a key contributor to, uh, to that outcome. Uh, he, was a, uh, he had a key role in supporting international conferences, which are supported by the Antennas and Propagation Society, and Kama and ICCM are two of such societies. I already mentioned that he also was quite active in the MTT Society. Uh, he was also active in other organizations, uh, other sister organization to us, uh, for example, ACES, he was in the board of directors of ACES, vice president of ACES, and he also had num numerous editorial roles. He was an advocate. He he wasn't just you know extending the role of this or that society or right to believe, but he was an advocate, outspoken advocate for diversity and inclusion in our entire global community. And he did this through his actions, not his words, but his actions. He was an indiscriminate fan of good ideas. He recruited people that he thought had good ideas and they could serve the, the technical society. Um, that's how I got involved in, in the AP society. Even though, of course, I had known him since I was a, a student, he was a, a young faculty member in uh, Syracuse. So I had obviously uh, known him, interacted with him technically, but then it was through uh, his advocacy and um, his encouragement that uh, I was able to get involved with uh, with the society and not just me so many of us you see these are the pictures that I uh, was able to find showing just how many people from around the world uh, interacted with him and he he was such an instigator and such uh, uh, such a, a nucleator of um, gatherings and ideas and, and and events we all owe a lot to him in that regard and of course, he was a good friend. Uh, he um, he traveled uh, the world and he made friends and he uh, he gathered people and he just uh, created so much energy and so much enthusiasm uh, that it was just so contagious. I really wanted to thank very uh, sincerely my friends and co colleagues, uh, Professor Magdalena Salazar Palma, uh, Ms. Yachio McLaughlin, uh, Professor Roberto uh, Graglia, and Professor Christian uh, Pichot for uh, providing some of these pictures and some of the material uh, for this so, I, so that I would be able to speak to you about uh, our memories and uh, our gratitude towards Taplin. We will all miss him. We will never forget him. How could we forget him? He's uh, always going to be a huge uh, influencer in our uh, society. Uh, so let me... Professor Mata, you are not audible. Can you please uh, check your mic? Mata is not audible, Sati. Can you uh, please uh, try to uh, uh, Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, just fine. Okay. Yeah, somehow I had gone on mute, and so maybe I just pressed some button accidentally, and my apologies for that. And yes. I don't know how long I was on mute, but I was uh, I was saying I was sending my regards to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. CJ Reddy, who I noticed was um, on the call as well. Um, so portions, uh, or I should say, actually, the, the, an extended version of what I'm presenting here was given at the AMTA 
uh, conference last year, and CJ was kindly uh, was kind enough to invite me to do that. Um, and sending my greetings to him. So, uh, what I wanted to do again in the in the spirit of remembering Tappan and how uh, interested he was uh, in having practical applications for electromagnetics. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of the imaging work that we have done in the past several years and the role of having uh, accurate practical antenna measurements to make sure that the results of our imaging systems are actually making sense and there are applicable and, and meaningful from a practical perspective. So I'll start by giving an overview of uh, the concept of imaging across different scales, and I'm going to divide that into two schemes, one proximal and one remote uh, sensing, and then uh, how we need antenna characterization for quantitative information retrieval uh, for both of these uh, imaging schemes across different scales. So I'll talk about remote sensing and uh, radar retrievals in that context, and I'll talk about uh, medical imaging for uh, thermal applications in the proximal sensing scheme. And then we'll talk about, uh, if there's time, we could talk about next generation sensing systems. So what do I mean by uh, imaging across scale? So let's think about the proximal sensing problem. So this is the class of problems that are encountered in medical imaging, in the ground penetrating radar, subsurface interface radar, discrete target detection, and so forth. So here's the case where you ha we have a target, and the target is observable from multiple directions, perhaps, whether it's full angle uh, availability or maybe it's just uh, uh, one-sided availability such as in geophysical um, applications. But the idea here is that the object is generally in the order of wavelength, could be numerous wavelengths, but it's still order of wavelengths. And the object is typically well-defined and deterministic. We're not talking about random uh, media, uh, deterministic targets here in the prox proximal sensing problem. We have good measurement access, and the resolution in this case is limited by the highest frequency that's available. So beyond the diffraction limit, whatever, uh, we could do in terms of numerical accuracy, that's our limit of resolution. Uh, uh, this type of problem allows idealized forward, forward and inverse electromagnetics modeling. And uh, what happens in this case for solving these problems is that the inverse problem is formulated for the electric field. And you know, as soon as you talk about formulating a problem in terms of the electric field, well, we have what we need ultimately is that uh, we assume that we need absolute calibration of complex field values. I'll talk about that and I'll talk about how that could be the, the unrealistic part of uh, this whole formulation scenario. And then let's also think about, uh, in contrast, let's think about the remote sensing problem. I'll come back in just a minute to the proximal sensing problem, talk about its challenges. And then uh, after that, uh, well, we'll actually we'll talk about the remote sensing problem as well and, and its challenges for, for uh, practical measurements. So the remote sensing problem is a class of problems that uh, is encountered in sensing the environment. For example, if you have airborne and spaceborne observations with radars, that's what we call the remote sensing problem. We use this to study the environment. We study soils. We study vegetation or surface topography. We study glaciers and the oceans and so forth. Uh, also in defense applications, remote sensing is used for surveillance uh, and security applications. So this ob object, uh, the class of objects that we observe are remote. And the object is often a complex scene, uh, could be many, many wavelengths. We're talking thousands of wavelengths in size. Uh, imagine a forest or, or the ocean. Uh, these are very huge targets. Uh, and the, these unknowns are not localized. These are random media. So it's not practical to think about discretizing such a scene and think, and, and uh, uh, deducing information from every single piece uh, of that scene. Uh, in these cases, the resolution of the imaging system is limited by the bandwidth. So it's not just the highest frequency that we use to observe. It's the bandwidth of the signal that uh, is relevant here. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, only backscatter measurements are possible. Uh, more recent systems, they use the concept of uh, 
reflectometry. So those are by static measurements, but still the number of observations is quite limited. Uh, and the type of information needed, as I mentioned, is uh, is very different. We're usually interested in bulk properties of media in these applications. For example, we're interested to know what is uh, a biomass of a forest or what is the water content in soil over a very large area. So in this case, the inverse problem, uh, inverse electromagnetic problem is formulated for scattering cross sections and not fields. Uh, and uh, even though we, we formulate for scattering cross sections, we still assume that we, we have absolute calibration of some sort for the scattering uh, cross sections here. So uh, for this class of problems, uh, you, you, would, you will see that many agencies, uh, um, space agencies in particular, and also defense agencies, uh, they're interested uh, more and more in an integrated observation strategy that includes not just satellite sensors, but also um, uh, signals of opportunity or reflectometry. So you could be looking at GPS signals or uh, uh, or FM, radio, or GSM, LTE type signals, and uh, through clever designs of receivers, you could be receiving um, re reflected signals from signals of opportunity. There's, of course, in situ sensors and sensor networks. There are um, more and more UAV-based sensors that are coming online, and, of course, uh, standard high-altitude airborne systems. Uh, you may know that, um, in fact, speaking of satellite sensors in the remote sensing area. The Indian Space Agency, ISRO, and NASA are collaborating on a, on a spaceborne radar system that is uh, scheduled to launch in a couple of years from an L-band radar system. I won't be talking about, about that, but that's actually, I just wanted to mention that, um, that there's quite a bit of interest in remote sensing applications in uh, India and collaborations internationally as well. So, uh, very uh, basic, and I apologize that this is too basic, but just to set the stage uh, for radar, as you know, radar is a very simple idea. Of course, the devil is in the details, but uh, the idea itself is quite simple. You have a pulse ecosystem. Uh, if you have a scatterer, whether this is a, a, a um, well-defined target or a random target, you have a transmitter. Uh, you transmit your signals through an antenna, interacts with the target, and you receive it at the receiving antenna. Uh, the receiver and transmitter could be co-located, which would be a standard backscatter radar or monostatic radar, or they could be separated, which would make a bistatic radar. And the measurements, the power received by this receiver um, is, is related to the transmit power through the radar equation. So what you see here up top, this is the generalized form of the radar equation that relates the received power to transmit power, some system parameters, and of course the properties of the target uh, uh, chiefly the scattering cross-section uh, in the form of a sigma naught or normalized scattering cross-section of a target. Uh, the timing diagram is shown here. So you have a transmit pulse, interacts with the target. The received uh, signal uh, shows uh, how the target spreads the signal and, and this scenario continues. So you have a pulse system that continuously transmits and received. And from this train of uh, of received signals, then you use the radar equation, you come up with measurements of the scattering cross-section of the target. Uh, and then, of course, there's all kinds of uh, analysis we do afterwards, so getting the scattering cross-section is not um, the end of the story. Once you have the RCS, then there, there's a lot more complicated tasks, which are to come up with actual properties of the scene. For example, what's the co water content in the soil, what is the biomass of a forest, and now, uh, if we think about the signal paths in the radar system, it could be pretty complicated. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side figure, this is a monostatic radar where your receiver and transmitter are co-located. You uh, send waves, uh, the wave, if, for example, if you have a forest and it's sitting on top of a rough surface, you can imagine the signal paths that are at play. Uh, the waves uh, interact with the vegetation canopy, with the ground surface underneath, with different layers of the ground underneath, depending on the wavelength, and all the multiple scattering interactions between what's on top of the surface and the surface and, uh, and the subsurface. Similarly, if you have a, a bistatic system, which is on, shown on the right-hand side, the incident waves coming from one side, and then you receive the scattered waves of, um, on some other uh, side, still the same sort of mechanisms at play, except the, the angle of observation is different. So you could say that there's numerous unknowns in this problem. Uh, first of all, the size of the problem is thousands and thousands of wavelengths, but also the type of unknowns are quite different. So this is a this could be a very tough 
problem to solve. The remote sensing community uh, is getting bigger and bigger. So people really spend years and years and decades, in fact, in trying to solve this kind of problem for, uh, for studying the Earth and planetary environments. Uh, so, but if you want to really simplify this problem, uh, you could think of it this way. Imagine here, uh, the, the inverse scattering approach that one can use to solve the radar problem is that, uh, let's assume your spacecraft or your aircraft flew, collected images of the scattering cross-section of, of an area. What I've shown here actually did the swatch on the left-hand side. The size of this scene is 100 kilometers. So this is a huge scene, uh, which one of our radars in fact collected. What we do is that every pixel in this image and this image, by the way, this particular one turns out to be about half a million pixels. Uh, of course, it's hard to tell in this scale, but uh, hundreds of thousands of pixels here. And we do the inverse problem per pixel. So what happens is that we send the scattering cross-section measurements into this black box. Of, it's a blue box here. It, it's uh, Think of it as a conglomerate of numerical elect electromagnetic scattering uh, solutions. So it's a black box. Sometimes, you know, I call it this a sausage maker. Uh, the observations go into this box and out from the other side through various um, uh, you know, um, computations come out some geophysical product, for example, a height of trees in a forest or soil moisture, uh, soil water content and other things. And there's a there's an electromagnetic inverse scattering algorithm involved. So computations are pretty intense. Uh, especially when you know, we solve global optimization problems. Uh, so you know, we use clusters and parallel computing and so forth to solve this problem. Um, but the computational problem on one side, the practical aspect that um, we always struggle with is that because you know, we're still formulating an elect electromagnetic scattering problem, what this assumes is that the scattering cross sections are well calibrated. So to achieve good results, we have determined through various sensitivity analyses that we need a half a dB of calibration accuracy, at least half a dB. Better, of course, is what we strive for, but at least the half a dB of calibration accuracy. And that's a tall order. It's really not easy to do. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll show you some examples of our results, and then uh, I'll say a little bit about the importance of antenna characterization in, uh, in achieving the results. Um, I'm going to do a time check. I don't want to take too much time. Let me skip some of these slides. So the, uh, I had some slides showing the, the complexities of doing the actual scattering uh, computations. Let me skip through that and let me show you uh, some results of an actual system. So this is a system that we developed in collaboration with NASA and JPL. Uh, it's called the Airborne Microwave Observatory of Subcanopy and Subsurface. It's a radar that uh, gets uh, mounted under a Gulf Stream airplane, so that you see uh, that pod there that can, that houses the radar. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the front side of the pod, which is the antenna. That's the side that uh, that we're not looking at is on the left hand side of the pod, and then uh, the side that is facing us that that includes all the electronics of the radar. It's a P-band radar, uh, operates in the 420 to 440 megahertz uh, band. Uh, so this is a state-of-the-art system. Uh, we've flown this uh, over many sites in North America. Some of the sites I've shown here. Uh, and from that, you know, we've developed many products, uh, uh, soil moisture products in particular. So we could essentially peel the surface all the way through the subsurface with this. This is computationally peeling the surface. So we can derive uh, soil water content or what we call soil moisture, which is not really um, a different representation of dielectric constant uh, of various areas. It's just one of the examples uh, of the areas we've flown. And you see that uh, in, in these four plots, on the top left is the surface water content as you uh, dig with electromagnetic signals deeper into the surface. We look at 10 centimeters, 30 centimeters, and 75 centimeters on the surface. This is a similar image, 100 kilometers long and about 25 kilometers wide, uh, hundreds of thousands of pixels here. And you see that with this instrument, we've been able to show that as you dig deeper in the surface, even though in a, in a very dry area such as Arizona, so this area, this uh, these images are from Arizona, you see that as you uh, dig deeper, even in the desert, 
uh, there's a lot of water. Uh, you only need to dig about a half a meter or a meter to, to see very wet soils. And this is the first time that we were able to demonstrate this. Of course, we flew this instrument in many, many locations, over 1,000 flight hours in four years, and we showed through field measurements, in situ field measurements, um, which is a really gold standard of uh, measuring water content in soils, that we achieve accuracies in our um, inverse scattering retrievals of about 5%, 5 or 6%, which, again, the first time that uh, this was able uh, to be achieved. Now, how did we achieve that and what more needs to be done? Uh, we would say 5% error is really good, but we need better. So this antenna uh, system and this radar system, uh, you know, of course, you know, it's a, you see the antenna here, is a four element uh, antenna. It's a cavity backed antenna. It's a uh, wide band. We only utilize a small portion of the bandwidth just because of uh, restrictions on uh, of uh, radio frequency transmission of the spectrum. Uh, but still, you know, when, uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of a complicated antenna and you know, we can characterize the antenna, simulate it, measure it in isolation. As soon as you put it on an airplane, then it starts interacting with the body of the airplane and a lot of complexities arise there. Uh, so, uh, and we obtain, as we illuminate an area on the ground, we, we illuminate an area that's 30 to 60 degrees incidence angle. Uh, what we do, because we, it's really difficult to simulate this entire thing and to measure the antenna pattern when it's mounted on an airplane, uh, what we do is that we resort to absolute calibration using external targets. Uh, and usually we use corner reflectors, uh, which are known uh, in terms of their uh, theoretical cross-section. But still, it's a challenge to come up with an antenna uh, pattern uh, when the antenna is mounted on a complicated structure. Uh, so it's still an outstanding problem, even though uh, you know the community, the remote sensing community has done uh, great things and we've achieved a lot of uh, advances in the past several years. Uh, still, we see that uh, there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties in antenna patterns. So this is uh, something that uh, for the new generation, for the next generation of radar scientists, if you're looking for something impactful that needs to be done, this is one of them. Uh, so um, I've shown some examples of measurements of, uh, of, of the antenna. Actually, these are simulations, not, not measurements of, of this antenna. Uh, but there's nothing like a measurement. And uh, coming up with a scheme to measure the antenna pattern while it's on the airplane, uh, that is still an outstanding problem. So we're going to uh, call this a, a partially solved problem, but still in terms of practical application, something that we still uh, need to uh, worry about. Now, let me switch uh, to a, and I'm looking uh, uh, at time. So how am I doing on, on time? I'm about half done through my talk. Should I speed up or is this? Uh... Uh, no, it's okay. Please. Um... Okay, I'll I'll try to. Yeah, I'll I'll try to uh, finish in about fifteen or twenty minutes. Uh, sure. Uh, so, you. okay, thank you. Uh, so now let's talk about the prox proximal sensing problem. I started my uh, the technical part of the talk by showing you this picture. Uh, so this is a class of problems uh, for medical imaging, ground penetrating radar, and so forth. Uh, so these problems, uh, from the perspective of the size of the problem, they are a little easier to handle than the remote sensing problem. However, the kind of information we need is also different. Whereas in the remote sensing problem, I could tell you that, okay, uh, you know, if, you, uh, if you're in a crop field or in a forest and you need information about the area at the 50 meter scale, uh, I said, okay, great, I can I can do that. I could uh, give you a bulk representation or an estimate of soil water content at pixel resolutions of 50 meters. When we move to medical imaging, for example, uh, obviously we need very, very fine resolution uh, products to be of use. Uh, for medical diagnostic and therapeutic applications, we're talking about millimeters, um, for sure, no worse than centimeter level resolution. So even though we have, we may have good access to the object for observation, uh, the challenges are different. And there's a lot of challenges actually with antenna systems in uh, in these very complicated observation scenarios. So um, 
how do we solve these problems? How do we solve the, um, the inverse problem? Uh, so if you have looked at solving inverse problems, you know that they usually are based on the solutions of forward scattering problems. Forward problems, of course, are the calculation of fields due to uh, the complex object scattering incident waves. It's, it's uh, still a research topic, even though for decades uh, we uh, we have been working on them. But you know, we do have solution methods. Obviously, we have method of moments. We have various fast multiple techniques to make uh, computations faster. We have time domain methods such as the finite difference time domain, and there's uh, hybrid methods, computational and analytical, and uh, we have the. the uh, uh, finite difference frequency uh, domain problems. So there are numerous solutions available, and uh, they they tend to become more accurate and faster as time goes by, and as our computational resources become more and more. And of course, more recently, a lot of learning methods are coming online, which allow us to solve these problems uh, more and more efficiently. Uh, but you know, we could file another uh, topic as a challenge, uh, which is. Uh, optimizing computational speed and minimizing uh, memory usage. So um, how do we solve these problems, the inverse problem? Uh, generally, the way these are uh, solved are by using a volume integral equation, and the volume integral equation is of the form that I've shown here. So uh, we formulated it as the total field being equal to the incident field plus a part that represents the scattered field. The scattered field can be uh, calculated by using a dyadic Green's function, which operates on an object function. This is the contrast. This is what we're looking for. And also, there is uh, the total field inside the object that is um, that figures into this formulation. Because of the way it's formulated, because uh, this integral includes both the object function and the field inside the object, this becomes a nonlinear problem. It's quite difficult to solve. There is no closed form solution for these problems. So oftentimes we resort to computations and, and iterative methods of solving uh, these problems. Now, another issue here, well, actually, bef before I go to the issues, let me say this. So uh, for this problem, there are many, many simulation results. So uh, in our group, we've done it and you know, several other colleagues have done excellent work in this area. So let's say we have an um, in, and you know we started with uh, simple problems in 2D, and you know more recently everyone has been solving three-dimensional problems. So, for example, let's say that we have uh, some targets, and we're trying to reconstruct. We could show in simulations that we can actually reconstruct the target with pretty good uh, accuracy and fidelity. We could uh, also we have shown that we could you know, we could reconstruct heterogeneous uh, targets with with relative, uh, relatively good accuracy. And, you know, this is just one example of what the community has done. There's many, many other um, examples. Uh, the issue is that even though we've been able to show a lot of good examples in simulation and some um, success in experiments, uh, there's, there's an underlying issue here. Uh, and um, I attribute it in large part to antenna characterization. So, uh, as I just mentioned, um, the, the solutions, solution methods are relatively mature. There's numerous publications. Um, uh, of course, you know, we keep wanting to reduce computation time and memory usage. Uh, but, you know, um, what really remains a challenge is that um, uh, getting, getting practical uh, is, is a problem. And wh why is that? Um, we, when we formulate the problem, and I'll uh, I'll come back to the formulation in a minute, uh, we are formulating uh, the inverse scattering problem in terms of fields. As you know, if you know if you are in the measurement uh, business in electromagnetics, you know that you never measure fields. You measure voltages. Your antennas uh, have uh, have ports. You you excite uh, current distributions on the surface of your receiving antenna. And that gets translated into a voltage that you measure. So uh, again, there's no even though we formulate things in fields, we talk about fields, electromagnetic fields, we don't measure them. Uh, so the question is, how do we uh, go from the formulation, which is in terms of fields, to the measurement, which is in terms of voltages? Uh, in other words, how can we formulate the inverse problem in terms of voltages? 
And uh, in doing that, how do we embed the antenna properties in the formulation of the inverse problem? So let me uh, say a little bit more about that. So let's say that we have an object here, so this, this blue blob of an object, it's what, let's just say that what, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we write down, this is the equation I showed you earlier, we uh, write the domain volume integral equation in terms of fields, uh, and it's formally in terms of the added greens function, object function, and again, the field inside the object. Uh, the, the second part, this one, is the scattered field, so that this uh, over here, uh, the scattered volume integral equation consists of just that integral part. And then the question is, uh, can we, instead of formulating this problem instead of fields, can I just scratch that and, form, and write in terms of voltages? Of course, I mean, it's not as easy as just scratching it. <laughs> we have to, to uh, derive uh, something that uh, replaces, for sure, the dyadic Green's function. The Green's function is a field entity. So you calculate fields by using the Green's function. Uh, can I come up, can we come up with um, an equivalent concept, but for voltages? So this is what we call the vector Green's function, as opposed to the dyadic Green's function, which relates fields to fields. Uh, we are interested in deriving a vector grades function, which relates voltages to voltages. And if we can do that, then uh, the, the challenge is partially addressed because now I can directly relate my measurement of voltages to um, in lieu of fields and then formulate the inverse problem. And in terms of the object doesn't care if you are measuring a voltage or a, or a field, uh, it's the same object function that we are trying to retrieve. So this is uh, basically the, the overarching concept. And uh, because I'm uh, keeping this talk short and, and somewhat high level, I won't be going through the details of that, but we've got several publications addressing uh, this problem. So by, uh, by implementing such a scenario, and by the way, the, the basis of, um, uh, of achieving this is through modal expansion. So what we do is, is, is uh, we use a spherical mode expansion of, uh, of antenna and we transform that into uh, voltages and in fact to voltage ratios because uh, we use vector network analyzers to, to make our measurements and those, as you know, those measurements are in terms of voltage ratios. So it's, yeah, so again, at a very high level, uh, the formulation is based on uh, spherical mode expansions of the fields into voltages. Uh, so we did several experiments, uh, simple ones, such as what you see here, and we, through this application, we got uh, pretty good results. Um, so pretty happy with that. Um, not that it's a completely solved problem, but it's, it's a proven approach uh, that uh, is ready for adoption in practical applications. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we, what we really want is uh, not to do inversions like this, which is, these are just, you know, toy, uh, measurements to to show proof of concept, but in terms of applications, what we really want is, for example, to be useful to the medical community. Uh, so there's uh, again many successful cases of uh, of showing that microwave imaging is applicable to medical applications, uh, but uh, still, I mean, there, unless you address this absolute calibration problem, uh, you will have imaging artifacts. You're always going to depend on some external calibration schemes to get um, to, to absolute retrievals or absolute image formation. So calibration was still an issue. Uh, now, I want to switch uh, noting that by using this concept of vector greens function, uh, one can address this problem. I want to take a few minutes. And uh, again, I'm mindful of time here. I, what, what I wanted to show you were the application of this method of uh, vector greens function to um, a medical application area, which is thermal therapy. Um, and I'm uh, kind of abruptly moving away from uh, imaging, electromagnetic imaging in medical applications for diagnostics to treatments uh, with kind of a side note that um, mi microwave imaging in medical applications are, uh, even though they could be partially successful, they have not been able to compete with um, their counterparts such as MRIs or ultrasound or x-rays because of, um, in my opinion, mostly because of uh, resolution requirements. We could have the best imaging methods and most accurate, but 
we still can't compete with the resolution that's afforded by uh, MRI or x-rays. Uh, but one area in which uh, we believe that microwaves have a huge role are in the area of thermal therapies uh, in medicine. Uh, so, and, and uh, these come about uh, in, in treatment of some cancers, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, God forbid, if, uh, you know, uh, if there's a disease, if there's cancer, there's not the um, treatment options conventionally are surgery, radiation, chemo, some hormonal therapies, uh, and immunotherapies. One, uh, in, in some cases where, uh, for example, surgery is not possible or other more invasive uh, procedures aren't possible, doctors have considered um, ablation therapies. So, for example, uh, brain tumors, uh, unfortunately, are uh, sometimes are not operable. And in such cases, uh, what the surgeons do is that they, they employ ablation uh, therapies, which is basically heating the area so that the cancerous tumor uh, is destroyed. And this is done externally. Or it could be actually a, a probe. So it could be a laser probe. It could be a, a microwave or RF probe. And some uh, non-contact uh, measures are also under consideration. Uh, so this is a this is a method for treating uh, cancerous legion uh, regions. The issue here is that uh, one could deliver this uh, heat therapy or thermal therapy, but unless you can monitor it, it has limitations and risks. For example, and and the images you're seeing here, these are actual images. Uh, and uh, so you could be under treatment, could be over treatment. If it's under treatment, the uh, the cancerous lesion is um, uh, is not completely ablated. It's not completely uh, destroyed. If it's over treatment, then the surrounding areas are destroyed. So in either case, it's not a good outcome. Uh, so what is needed in this case is to be able to monitor uh, the deposition of uh, of heat in these regions. And it's a, that's actually a pretty difficult task. Uh, you need monitoring and feedback. You need guidance uh, during these uh, procedures. Uh, right now, MRI is the state of the art, but it's very complex to do that. It's, it's expensive. It's very slow. You have to reel the patient from one operating room to another operating room to do an MRI. Uh, so uh, it's being considered, but it's, it's not yet very practical. So what we have done is that we proposed a microwave system, an imaging system for real-time monitoring of uh, thermal treatments, which is which can be a serious uh, contender in, in this uh, technology or in this application. And the basic principle of that is the following. So if you look at this uh, figure here, and this is uh, just for water, these are actual measurements, uh, our measurements in the lab. So if you look at the relative permittivity of water as a function of temperature, there is a very strong dependence. So you see that in the um, in the range of thermal therapies, which would be about body temperature to about 60 degrees Celsius, the dielectric permittivity of water uh, changes quite a bit. And I'm looking, I we're looking at water because biological tissue is mostly composed of water. So this kind of relationship is expected to take place with biological tissue as well. So the idea here is that if we can measure the electric constant, and when I say measure, I mean image. So if you use a microwave imaging technique to, uh, to map the electric constant within a treatment zone, uh, so uh, imagine the, the, the area of brain, which is being ablated, let's say through a, a laser uh, probe. If we have a microwave imager that can um, uh, come up with a high resolution three-dimensional map of the electric constant, and uh, if we can monitor this quickly and in real time, then we are able to translate the dielectric constant map into a temperature map and therefore achieve the result that we want, which is real-time monitoring of these thermal uh, treatments. So this allows us to use microwave imaging for temperature mapping and monitoring instead of a diagnostics tool. Uh, in, in mapping such treatments, we don't need as uh, fine a resolution as a diagnostic tool. We, um, if, if diagnosis requires a millimeter type resolution for uh, heat imaging applications, uh, what we understand is that the resolutions of maybe five times of that are sufficient. 
So maybe five millimeter resolution is sufficient and that we can achieve with microwave imaging. So uh, using the techniques that I've uh, briefly described before and some lab setups, we've shown uh, that this is achievable. So we have our, uh, so we constructed an, an imaging cavity uh, with some coupling medium in between and we inserted different kinds of targets in there. Uh, this is, uh, again, some of these were pretty simple targets. So ping pong ball filled with water, heated, and then we looked at how uh, the temperature um, faded away. We constructed phantoms. So these are layered uh, media which mimic biological tissue. So we, we heated uh, multiple regions in the object and we, we showed that indeed we can track uh, the, the temperature variations through microwave imaging experiments. And uh, we did some analysis showing that the resolution, the, te the temperature resolution of, um, of these observations is about half a degree to a degree Celsius. It's again sufficient for uh, thermal monitoring uh, applications. And the, the spatial resolution we achieved was also about a half a centimeter. Uh, so, and then we, we repeated these experiments with uh, different types of uh, uh, probes, the RF probe, which we obtained from our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and, and this was, so whereas the previous experiment I showed you briefly, that, that was a cooling down experiment. We started with a heated um, water uh, containing the ping pong ball. This experiment was a heating up experiment, and um, again, I'm going to have to skip some of these just uh, in the interest of time, um, and I just want to quickly go to some of the results that we have obtained in the heating experiment. So you see here, these are actual measurements, of actual imaging results. So you see that ping pong ball, ball uh, heating up, and then it is uh, dissipated again, and, the, and we have some late time artifacts. So you see some artifacts going on the walls. Those are not real. Those are just uh, because we let uh, the computational domain uh, uh, keep uh, going. Now, one thing that has enabled us to achieve these um, near real time, actually real time, is one, what you see here is one frame per second of uh, image update, which is plenty of time resolution for, um, for thermal therapy applications. Uh, the reason that we have been able to do this is through uh, coming up with differential imaging scheme, which is that we start from um, from some baseline that we know of, and then um, we're able to construct uh, re reconstruct images at each step based on a differential image that we reconstruct from the previous step. So, if you're familiar with inverse scattering problems, which are nonlinear, we solve multiple iterations usually to get to good results. Uh, but here, we don't have to do multiple iterations at each subsequent step because each heating step is related to the previous one through uh, what we consider to be a linear um, operation for the integral equation. Uh, and then we've done uh, further simulations for much more uh, complicated targets. So this is the a brain uh, phantom here, and you see here that we are, uh, so that's a tumor area. This is the probe inserted into, um, into this phantom, and you see on the right-hand side uh, as time goes by, how we could image the uh, the variations in the electric constant and therefore temperature of the the region being heated. This is another view of the same uh, of this experiment. Uh, so two different schemes. On the left is the Born approximation. On the right is the distorted Born approximation for the integral um, uh, equation. Uh, inversion and then the, the middle is is the truth so we see that you know we can reconstruct the actual um, temperature with pretty high fidelity and uh, here is uh, here's a near real time uh, tracking of how how we could uh, map the heat and the the figure in, in the middle that shows the thermal dose being administered as a function of time and the, the images on the right and left show uh, the actual area being imaged. Okay, so uh, let me, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, ma'am, it's okay. Just uh, you're rouse, wrapping up, right? Yes, yes, this is my final chart. Uh, so uh, just wanted to um, 
in very broad terms, emphasize the importance of um, good measurements, good antenna characterizations, which uh, are key in both remote sensing problems and in proximal uh, sensing problems. There are uh, there's much knowledge that has been accumulated over the years and decades, but we are finally now at a point where we are able to put all this knowledge into work by harmonizing computational approaches, experimental systems, and physics-based um, and data-centric analysis. I didn't say anything about all the data science and uh, learning, deep learning aspects that come into play uh, recently. So that's some of our recent work, but that's uh, whatever we do, whatever methods we used, it's, it must be emphasized that the accurate antenna characterizations and re realistic measurement schemes are key in everything that we do. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Mark. My pleasure. Uh, you covered a span ranging from remote sensing to medical imaging within a span of, I believe, an hour. That's wonderful. The volume of work, I mean, it's uh, it's great. And I would request questions from the audience if you have any queries. I don't see any on the chat box. So, Professor so, so if I yeah. can make a one uh, maybe. Yeah, sure. A question or a comment, maybe. Hi, Mahada. Very nice to hear your talk again. Uh, it was, of course, very good talk at AMTA, and also uh, now I think you know more comprehensive here. Uh, one thing that I had in my mind was that after you gave that talk, we wrote a white paper with uh, Professor Kistorulu and his student Monica on high fidelity pre characterization with all you know leaves and everything like that, uh, generating the ISAR images. And I wanted to send you that uh, paper to you, but it has been in my long to-do list, I guess. <laughs> I'll send that to you sometime, uh, maybe after this talk. I'll say it was Fantastic. Nice talk, I guess. So. But also, I want to take this opportunity <clears throat> to talk a little bit about maybe a couple of sentences of my association with Professor Tapan Sarkar. Though, you know, I did not get to work with him very closely, but my first interaction with him was uh, in person was in 1987 at a conference that we held in IIT Kharagpur. At that time, I was a PhD student presenting my, you know, very initial microchip line uh, paper. I think he already, I think, uh, worked in that area very extensively with uh, multi-conductor transmission lines and those kind of things. So he was giving me advice on, you know, look at the paper and those kind of things. Later, when I joined uh, Samir in Bombay, Bombay, um, I can't, came to know that my boss, uh, another uh, Dr. Sarkar, Vinay Kumar Sarkar, he was a classmate, not classmate, but they were roommates at uh, IIT Karakpur, uh, in Nehru Hall, if I remember correctly. <laughs> he was, my boss was the uh, graduate student, and um, I think Professor Sarkar was at his final uh, undergraduate studies, I guess, there. They were very close friends. So he used to come to Bombay, and my task always, because I work for my boss, was to pick him up at the airport <laughs> with a car and those kind of things, bring him to Samir and, you know, he will give a talk and all those things. Of course, I met him numerous times after I came to the U.S. And um, I also remember with the process, Dr. Sudhakar Rao invited both of us to his home in Newtown, Pennsylvania in 2007. We had a lunch together at that time. So I just wanted to remember my association with, of course, there's a little bit more in the technical side. I used to work in a method called asymptotic waveform evolution, which is somewhat similar to Cauchy method that he was um, working on at that time. So we have some commonality in that respect as well. Thank you very much for the, giving the opportunity to remember Professor Sarkar. I know that we're all going to miss him at the conferences as well as at the, his contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Really a pleasure, and of course, this is, we have to live with his memories. Uh, thank yeah. you. Coming back to the talk, there yeah. are a few questions in the chat box. Sorry, yes, Mike, I, I missed them. I have a few comments, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, before you yes, can please, go. Please, please go ahead. It was a like, uh, beautiful talk. Uh, thanks, Professor Mahatha, for uh, like covering a wide range of topics. And I mean, I, I am particularly interested in. I mean, I can say many of them, but uh, in the final portions, I was seeing some of the work on the uh, thermal ablation and all, and maybe 
I mean, uh, later on uh, offline, I, I, I might try to get in touch with you uh, to like uh, learn more about it. And I hope that, that will be a good of course, and, Absolutely. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, and uh, since I mean, today we are uh, remembering uh, Professor Tapan Sarkar. I know I am uh, like just a uh, uh, young professional, but I would like to like a couple of uh, nice uh, memories that I have. And one of them also involves uh, Professor Mahata when we actually had that uh, very uh, nice and cozy uh, dinner and uh, I think uh, Dr. Ajay Poddar's room in Atlanta. Uh, I, I guess it was probably the like before the pandemic that was the APS uh, that was held in Georgia. So and I, of course uh, thanks to Dr. Saha and uh, Dr. Javad we had that informal meeting. And, it was a nice memory for me as a young APS volunteer. I could actually interact with uh, so many stalwarts uh, and at the same podium. And at the same time, I was fortunate to present some of my uh, works that I did in my PhD uh, in front of uh, Professor Sarkar in IIWE 2018, which uh, Dr. Saha organized in Trivandrum. So it was uh, actually a very uh, inspiring experience for me because Professor Sarkar, after uh, my uh, talk, he actually uh, kind of appreciated and also suggested me some of the things that I could do later on. So I just I wanted to chip in with because I think uh, he will leave with us to his work and uh, his motivation and the memories. So that's uh, all I mean from my side and thanks for ar arranging this uh, event. Thank you. Thank you, Nadu Devdeep Sarkar. Thank you very much. Really Hello. Hello, yeah. I'm Raghavan. Uh, yes, Professor Raghavan, please go ahead. Uh, just uh, one minute I want to share. Uh, yes, please. Uh, can you see the slide? Uh, yes, we can see that. Yes, yes. Uh, Be very brief, Professor. Okay. Okay, I, I, I just want to take only one or two minutes. Um, it was due to Dr. Chinmaya Saha, Dr. Tapan Kumar Sarkar, the tallest man of India in antenna or in the world, came all the way to Tichy. Of course, uh, Dr. Javad Sarkar also came. Uh, and uh, the uh, one fine morning he told, Raghavan, I found uh, Lord Ganapati's vehicle in my uh, guest house room. Next only he told, it was a mouse. Mouse was in their room. So that way he used to talk in a very jovial way. And uh, that day we put a quiz in the uh, conference. We asked who was the guide of uh, Dr. Tapan Kumar Sarkar. That person was nobody other than the toughest uh, author, Dr. Harrington. So we can say uh, Dr. Sarkar was uh, Harrington of India. The last thing I want to tell very in a proud way is in the whole proceedings, of course, the uh, the man behind the success of that conference, international conference, was no other than Dr. Chinmaya Saha. Dr. Tapan Kumar Sarkar's wishes alone was in uh, handwritten one. So he wrote it uh, fully in a page and that he had sent. So in any case, uh, uh, definitely it's a great uh, day today that uh, Dr. Chinmaya Saha and the group have conducted the fitting uh, memory for the uh, tallest man of antenna of the world. Thank you. Lord. Thank you very much, Professor Raghavan, for your nice gesture and sharing the memory. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mata. Would it be possible for you to take a few questions? I mean, if yeah. this yeah. Yes. Javed, yes. So yes. I want to take some few seconds. Thank you. Uh, pardon me? Yes. Uh, Okay, Dr. Paul, Paul, I would like to say something. Please, sir, go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, I wish to thank uh, Kerala section and Chinmay for arranging such a wonderful lecture by Professor Mahata. Uh, myself and uh, Professor Tapan Sarkar were good friends. We belong to the same age group. The difference was he was uh, more of an analytical person. I was more of a practical person. We, but we had a good discussions. We met almost a half a dozen times whenever he came to India. And last was when he came for some educational conference, which was arranged by Parveen Bahir. We used to always argue and discuss about the, you know, teaching the electromagnetics in India. And he was very critical 
in his uh, characteristic style of the way in which he was taught by his teachers, the stalwarts, for whom I had a great respect. But uh, we, we thought that, yeah, it is possible to change the total teaching scenario in the country when I was vice chancellor at that time. But uh, the period was very short to implement his suggestions. And uh, he always appreciated our efforts without much of a resources at our end in ISRO, particularly in ISRO, because uh, we started from the scratch and did things. And we were good friends. Uh, I really felt very sad when I came to know about it. Uh, and my humble tribute to Professor Sarkar. And also, I wish to thank Professor Mahata for the wonderful lectures he gave. Uh, since I come from the remote sensing area, also in my remote sensing project, so, so I could quite a bit. I'm also thankful to Dr. Magdalene Saljar Palma. Uh, I have met her a couple of times and she was really emotional. The tribute came from her heart. So, we, I mean, we all persons in India will be always proud of the contributions of Professor Tapan Sarkwa. And I lost a friend, personal friend, I must say so. We belong to the same age group, belong to the same area, working in the same area. Only thing difference was he was a political person, I was more of a practical person. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak for him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. I still remember the Bangalore evenings that we had even I was there in the event that was held and the bonfire chat that we were having. These were memories to be left with. Uh, yes, uh, going back to the technical talk, uh, Professor Mata, there's a question. Uh, Professor Raghavan, can you please stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, please stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Uh, Professor Raghavan, can you please stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Uh, there's a question. Given that we have limited penetration, uh, depth of penetration of EM waves, there seem to be a fundamental limitation in microwave imaging. For instance, in biological tissues, which are highly lossy. Can this uh, issue be resolved? Well, it's a long-standing issue. I mean, it can be resolved to a degree, uh, not entirely. Of, um, as, I mean, you you put your finger on the problem. Right? I mean, it's it's lossy, so you know we just. Uh, and there's always this competition between penetration depth and resolution that we get. Uh, and that's partially why our, the, the adoption of microwave imaging as a diagnostics or screening tool has been limited. Because at the frequencies where we can penetrate enough to, uh, to image deep enough within the body, we don't get enough resolution. We don't get the millimeter level resolution that is needed for early stage detection of various cancers. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's it's a trade off. It's, it's physics that ultimately uh, limits us. Now, of course, you know, as the, the measurement techniques enhance and we come up with better electronics and much lower noise levels, uh, so that the signal to noise ratio is you know advanced or enhanced. We could push that boundary, but at some point, the, the physics of the problem uh, limit us. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question by Professor V. Mahadevan, and he asks, is human safety for microwave radiation the main reason for microwave not being used in medical applications? And then at micro uh, yes, diagnostic or screen tool is, in my opinion, is the resolution that we can't really achieve. You know, microwaves, they're um, not harmful to the human body at, and definitely not at the intensity levels that we use for imaging applications. They're really no, uh, no more intense than a cell phone uh, signal. Uh, so safety is not an issue with microwave imaging. It's, it's what we can do. The, the physics of the problem that limit the resolution, in my opinion, that's really the limitation. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I some... would, uh, pardon, yes. if I just can add a uh, quick comment that, in fact, I mean, a lot of people argue that the safety of microwaves is what uh, no, we have going for microwave imaging. If, if we can make it just more practical, then you know, it's it's harmless. Yeah, it's safer than x-rays, definitely. definitely. Absolutely. Uh, can you suggest uh, which type of antennas are preferred in biomedical devices? So it depends on the device. If uh, for the imaging applications, uh, practically speaking, we are finding that um, 
planar antennas where which we can mount on you know around imaging apparatus and cavities those are uh, those are the most practical I mean, there are some systems yeah. Yeah. Uh, excuse me there are some systems some microimaging systems that have used monopole type antennas as well uh, but i think ergonomically if you can print antennas those those would be the most practical there's a question from milan how much power do the microfabrication need to treat the cancer cell? Is it possible to transfer this amount of power to the desired by phased array antenna? How do you see the near field terahertz antenna located on probe to give the desired heat in the desired place and direction? Right. So for the for the ARPs, we're talking more of bots. Or, but uh, having a non-contact, so a remote focusing, that actually has been considered. In fact, we've done some experiments in the lab, and it's done both with microwaves and with ultrasound. There are images, uh, there, there are systems called HIFU or high intensity focused ultrasound, which deliver focused energy into ablation domains. Uh, with microwave techniques, we've also shown that it's possible. So imagine your uh, your imaging array, instead of being used only for imaging, it could also be used for transmitting high, uh, higher intensity waves to focus energy. And you could steer the beam um, just like you would with any antenna array. So it's definitely possible. And again, you know, it's uh, what you need to, to achieve that heat uh, to, to kill, the, to ablate uh, those regions is uh, on the order of watts of power. Um. Thank you, Professor Mata. There's another last technical question in the chat box, and it's from Rashidia Hanan. And the question is, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, regarding inverse computation, one of the possible ways to reduce the computational load is using surface integrals based formulations instead of volumetric integrals. In terms of a practical biomedical application, will this cause any kind of disadvantage? The problem with surface integrals for the formulation of inverse problem is that uh, we do, what we really are interested in is the volume. So if if there are practical ways of transforming the volume integral equation to surface integral equation, sure, we would definitely be reducing the computational load. But because the in, if you think about the interior of the human body, it's a very heterogeneous domain, and to come up with the uh, with the uh, equivalent formulation that would um, uh, represent the high resolution interior of the volume with good fidelity in the surface volume, uh, uh, rather the surface integral equation, that will not be possible. So it's, uh, as of now, we don't know of a way to transform that the information from the volume integral equation to a surface integral equation. So I can add one comment on that one um, uh, question, I guess. If yes. you use inter surface integral equation, then you have to enclose every tissue you have inside the body with a surface to represent that surface, which could also enhance the you know computational complexity that you may have. And the other problem could be is that the volume integral equations are very stable for um, what we call you know high contrast materials. You have low dielectric constant, high dielectric constant. All of them can be very I think it also to lower frequencies, I guess, very stable matrix. So, um, yeah, that way volume integral equation, I think, is better than uh, surface for these type of problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, this uh, professor, DC Pan, Dr. DC Pandey is on call and he would like to say something. May I request Dr. DC Pandey to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Siddiqui. <clears throat> it is great uh, uh, talk today. It was really interesting being in the radar field, so I could understood a lot of things that are about this one and the way the things are going on. Of course, it is very interesting talk in the biomedical uh, field and microwave using in the biomedical field is very important. Yes. If we can do that, okay, my mentor, Dr. Kalbom, used to talk about the impulse type of the radiation for this type of the uh, analysis because so that you can uh, do some better analysis of the thing because the, you can get with the impulse signal, the bandwidth is uh, quite big and so the resolution is the better. So he was working 
you know, before his death on this one. So it is a very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Matam, for this one. And about Professor Kapan uh, Sarkar, see that, okay, I could not sleep for three, four days because see that I had the interaction when he came under the talk term program to LRD twice. Once he came for that, you know, that time that okay, a lot of his issues were going on in the uh, multi-label, uh, you know, PCB design for the signal integrity and all that thing because the electromagnetics was coming in a very big way because high speed uh, digital designs so that okay he was doing some issues so i used to interact with him in the somewhere in 88 89 and then again he came in the 90s and that uh, time we was working something on the sorted array antenna uh, which uh, we were working together and so he was there for about say two months two months of the talk term program that time government of india we had got some talk term program after that whenever he was coming in the conferences we were meeting him and i used to take him to the bangalore particularly in our lab in lrd so he used to like very much to come to that one and it was a great loss for me that okay last time when i got caught him i was in the you know the talk goes Uh, Prof. Zaved and the doctor called me in the Bangalore. So I told her, okay, after going immediately, you come to the Bangalore. So I booked for him the uh, thing. And so he was being picked from the uh, his house and brought, you know, near to the aircraft and took from the aircraft. He came there and in Bangalore also, he was picked from the, you know, tarmac itself and brought to the, uh, you know, that uh, to my, you know, to his hotel and other things. So he was so thrilled. He says that, okay, I never got this type of the reception, taking me from the tower mic itself to the place. So then that time he came and the LRD 